Good morning. Welcome to our morning devotions. It is Friday. Believe it or not, here we are at Friday morning and uh, coming to you here from my back deck. Uh, you can hear the birds starting to sing the morning awake and uh, God has given us a new day and uh, love seeing the sun come up over the horizon here on my back deck. Just a reminder of God's mercy and so as you're logging on, love for you to leave a comment. Good morning, Miss Tracy. Happy Friday to you. Good morning, Brother Barry. Good to see you this morning. Uh, many of you logging on. Um, I, I'm just so humbled. I, I want to say that. Um, thank you for joining in these morning devotions. Um, I thought a lot about it this week. Uh, as we're all walking through this together, good morning, Miss Sandy. Um, these devotions started... Uh, as a result of the uh, good morning, God is good, Brother Jim. Good morning, Miss Melanie. Um, good morning, Miss Carol. Good to see you this morning logging on. Good morning, Mama Teen. I see you there this morning. Thank you um, for all the folks, uh, Miss Joyce. Um, you know, these devotions that we're doing, um, Miss Jean, see you there, um, started um, during the COVID-19 Miss Vicky, good morning. Um, and we're just, Miss Whitney, good morning to you. Thank you for being a part. Miss Joyce, God bless you. Um, these started as we were walking through it together. Um, good morning, Brother Hoyt. Uh, what a blessing. Um, Brother Hoyt yesterday helped us tremendously. Good morning, Brett. I'll see you there, brother. Uh, thank you for being a part this morning. And, um, I'm just honored that we're still walking through it together. Um, when I saw Miss Donna Jean post um, about a prayer need, and many of you responded, and then I've seen that happen before, um, I just, it's a community of believers together, growing together, encouraging one another. Thank you for being a part of these morning devotions. We're in Colossians chapter 2. You know, this morning, as we begin in the middle of Colossians 2, I had a thought this morning in my own heart. It's exciting to, to read and study the book of Ruth, a love story, pictures for us, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for us, Jonah. I mean, who doesn't want to read about Jonah and the whale? But oftentimes, when we get into a book like Colossians, and particularly we get into the doctrine of of Christianity, it can seem dry. In other words, it can be hard trudging sometimes. But I want you to know how vital doctrine is in the Word of God. We're talking about a church Paul wrote to 2,000 years ago, okay, about getting their focus on the Lord Jesus Christ because there were many that were trying to pull away from who Jesus was and who Jesus is and what Jesus did. And they were trying to either add to or take away from Jesus. Fast forward with me, if you would, to where we live right now. And think with me for a moment how important this book is to show us who Jesus was, who Jesus is, and what he continues to do in our life. Don Lemon, one of the reporters on CNN, as he's talking to Cuomo this week, and they're having a dialogue about tearing down the statues of our forefathers, which I have a very strong opinion about that. But here's what, here's what he said. He said, if Jesus is who you believe in, even Jesus was not perfect while living here on this earth. Now, you can fact check me. That's exactly the words he said to a viewing audience on national television. For those that were there that maybe don't know the Word of God, don't have a foundation in God's Word, they could begin to sit there like the devil whispered to Eve in the garden, hath God really said, was Jesus really perfect? Was he really the Son of God? Was he, did he really live a sinless life? And if they don't have the doctrine of God's Word implanted in their heart, they can be led astray. But praise God for the people of God who can sit there and go, wait a minute, not only do I know in my heart that's wrong, I can show you Scripture 
to back up. And by the way, can I say this? You're going to see things on the internet, even for me, please, fact check me by the word of Almighty God. And so I just want to encourage you. Doctrine can seem dry. You say, boy, I, I, it's, it's just hard trudging sometimes. I get it. But here's what I thought about this morning. Doctrine, it may seem dry, but you know what else is dry? Gunpowder. But when you light the fire to that gunpowder, boom, there's an explosion of power that comes. Doctrine may be dry, but it's the gunpowder of the Christian life that when the Holy Spirit hits that doctrine, it, it causes an explosion in our heart of power. The doctrine is the fuel that fuels the power of God in us. I'm telling you, I, I just got excited about that. So thank you for being a part of these morning devotions. And I know I've taken a little bit of time, but I wanted to encourage you that doctrine as we're trudging through, it may seem dry, but it's giving you a solid foundation so that when the Holy Spirit ignites your heart through the maybe the dryness of the doctrine, it can fire you up and give you the power of the Christian to live the Christian life. Such is the case in verses 11 down through verse 15 where Paul lays out for the church at Colossae, again, the centrality of Christ, that nothing needs to be added to Christ. Listen when he speaks in verse 11. Second, uh, chapter 2 of Colossians, verse 11. That's where we're landing at today. In whom you also are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also are you risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, I circled that in my Bible. Paul was pointing and saying, and you now, wait a minute, this is not just an abstract teaching, it's you, it's personal. Being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you of all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. I circled that as well. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Great truth about what Jesus Christ does for us in the fullness. Now remember, we're, it all flows together. So here we were in 9, 10, and 11. He says that the fullness of God is in, is in Jesus, and then we are complete in him, we are full in him, and he gives us an uh, uh, ex explanation of what it means to be full in Jesus and complete in him, lacking nothing. So pray with me. Father, thank you for your word. Speak to us now. Ignite the gunfire and the gunpowder of the doctrine of Jesus in our heart today. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul had said, you don't need anything but Jesus. You are complete in him. We looked at that yesterday where he said, he's all I need. And so Paul would continue that sentence and saying, in him, that's in Jesus, you have the circumcision that's not made without with hands. It's the putting off the sins. And then he says, buried with baptism. So right off the bat, Paul says, I want to show you two rituals that if we're not careful, people want to add to in a sense of these also must take place in order for you to get to heaven or have a relationship with Christ. Now, circumcision, going all the way back to Abraham. It was a, uh, a rite and ritual to signify their dedication to God that they would be set aside and cutting the foreskin from a man and that would signify the cutting away of their own heart, if you will, and dedicating that to the Lord. It was symbolic of their dedication to the Lord. As a matter of fact, all the way out through the Old Testament, they were let us know it was symbolic because the prophets would often say, well, you've been circumcised in the flesh, but your heart is still uncircumcised. Your, your mind is still uncircumcised. In other words, that you have not given yourself completely over to the Lord. So here's what was happening. 
the Jewish believers and even the 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 uh, Jewish um, sect who had not fully trusted in Christ would say to the Gentiles, if they were going to join Judaism, they had to be circumcised. So once a Jew got saved, they would say to the Gentiles, hey, if you're really going to follow God, if you're really going to be dedicated, you need to also be circumcised. And Paul said, wait a minute, no, no, no. The circumcision that we have is in Jesus, and it's the circumcision of cutting away of the flesh of our inward nature. In other words, it means that Paul says, I don't need a circumcision from my outward self. I need a circumcision of the heart, and that's what Jesus does. It is the cutting away of the sins of the flesh, and it literally means to cut away and to dispose of, never to become against us again. It is the full forgiveness that we find in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are complete in him. We do not have to add any other ritual. It's an inward work that has manifested itself outwardly. Then he goes on to talk about baptism. Bared with him in baptism, or also you're risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Now, baptism would also be a part of the Jewish religion. But what Jesus, when he began the church, he said, this is an outward symbol of what's happened on the inside. When we, That's why baptism is a picture of salvation. It has to come after salvation. It can't come before as a baby. Or, or it can't come as a, as a rite of passage at a certain age in your life. Baptism comes after salvation. Why? Baptism doesn't save you. But it is an outward um, symbol of what's happened on the inside. And that's what's happening. He says, listen, baptism is important, but the true baptism is when you gave your life to Christ, you were buried with him and raised to a new life. So why do we have baptism? To give an outward expression to the world that when I go into that water, I am buried with Christ and I'm raised to a new person. But Paul says the inward work of, of Christ is that I am raised with him. He has quickened me. In verse 13, he says not only that he said that it's not the circumcision of the flesh, but of the spirit. And he's forgiven all our trespasses. So what do we have in Jesus? Full forgiveness. I don't have to have another rite or ritual to get me into heaven. Thank God for baptism. And if you're saved and you're following Jesus and never been baptized, can I encourage you? It's the first step of obedience. But baptism itself does not save you. And baptism plus salvation doesn't get you to heaven. It's salvation only. It is Jesus only. Paul was saying to that church and saying to our church today, there is great emphasis placed on things that are symbolic and, and, and they're important. But those alone do not save you. It is Christ alone that gives us full forgiveness. And then look what he says here. He gives us complete salvation, full forgiveness, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Paul give a, give he talked about the baptism and the rituals and circumcision. Now he's giving a, a, another um, opportunity uh, to show a metaphor of what could happen. So here's what he's saying: We're completing him. What does that mean? It, it means complete salvation, full forgiveness. Paul is giving the illustration, if you will, of debt. Okay. So in those days, they would have where, where you and I owe debt. And, and if you've ever paid debt off, what an amazing feeling, right? And I can remember so, certain payments that I was making to pay debt off and that, that final payment to be able to think it's paid in full. The, what Paul's talking about here is literally an IOU in that day. And it would be written on the papyrus, which would be the one of the papers they would use. And it would simply list the debts that someone owed. And then someone could come along after someone paid that debt and they would use this paper over and over. It could take a sponge and clean that writing off and so it would be free and clear and nothing was to be, um, nothing could be remembered by what was there. But what about the nailing it to the cross? Well, in Paul's day, when someone had paid a debt in full, 
it would be nailed for the whole community to see and know the debt had been paid. So what's Paul saying? You and I owed a sin debt we could not pay. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And you and I, we owed that debt. And, and, and our death would not pay that debt. Why? Because we had sin in our life. We, we, we were separated from God because of our sin. It took the blood of a sinless lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why John would say the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Do you see how important it is that people know that Jesus Christ was 100% man and 100% God while he lived on this earth and lived a sinless life? Because if he did not, he's only one man among many. Nothing sets him apart. Nothing separates him from every man that's ever been born. But our Bible teaches us he had an earthly mother, but he had a heavenly father. Who, and Mary was a virgin who God implanted the seed of Christ in her womb. He never was tainted by the blood of men. And he lived a sinless life by his nature and by his choices. So that he, could, he could pay the complete sin debt, nailing it to his cross. Why is that important? Because all throughout history, there were men that were crucified on a cross for debt that they had owed, for crimes they had committed, and that was their cross. But only one man went to his cross and died for our sins, the perfect man, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he outstretched his hands and he said to tell us die, paid in full. Paul says he took our sin debt and nailed it to his cross, having forgiven us all of our trespasses. Hallelujah, happy Friday. Jesus died for our sins and rose again. But it gets better. It gets gooder and gooder. Who said doctrine is dry? Am I helping some? I mean, help me somebody right here. We're talking about the fact that I don't have to have anything but Jesus to get to heaven. I don't have to meet a ritual. I don't have to meet a, 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 a checklist. I just have to trust Christ and Him alone. And when I do that, He forgives my sins. And He takes the, 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 the sins and He blots them out. But verse 15 spiritual victory. Notice what he says. And having spoiled principalities and powers. We've talked about that a lot through Colossians. The Gnostics would say there's the spiritual world. And Jesus would say, you're absolutely right. There is the spiritual world that we cannot see of angels and demons and the demonic of the principalities and powers of the air, Ephesians would say. That there is a spiritual dynamic and a spiritual war taking place all around us in spiritual warfare. And Paul says, you need to know that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that he spoiled principalities and powers. That word spoiled literally means to strip away the authority and the power of the opposing force. It speaks of a conquering Roman general who would go into a land, own their land, and win the battle, and then bring those captives back and parade them through the streets of Rome held captive in parade and in great majesty and power and say they are the defeated foes. Jesus Christ came to this earth where the principalities and powers were, were the Bible says, the ruler of this world, Satan himself. But Jesus came into this world and he died on the cross and he stepped on Satan's head. He is a defeated foe, been stripped of his authority and power. Jesus now holds the keys to death, hell, and the grave. We know that from Revelation chapter 1. So why do we still battle? He will not give up. He will not relinquish the battle. But hear me, child of God. There's coming a day soon and very soon. When the Lord is going to split the eastern sky, we're going to go to be with him in heaven. And then seven years later, he's going to come upon this earth, fight the final fight, chain Satan for a thousand years, 
after that thousand years is over, he will throw him into the pits of hell and he will never ever listen. He's a defeated foe. He's a mountain lion with a roaring lion with a roar, a loud roar, but he's toothless because Jesus Christ knocked his teeth in. On the cross. See, preacher, you shouldn't say stuff like that. That's exactly the language. He defeated. I'm going to tell you something. When I played football, the sweetest victories I had, thank God for the victories we had at home. But when we had marched on somebody else's field and beat them handedly, that was a sweet victory. Jesus came from heaven to earth on the battleground right there face to face with Satan. And Satan threw everything he had at him and on the cross. But listen to me, what he thought was defeating Jesus was actually liberating us. And Jesus on the cross spoiled principalities and power, openly triumphing over them. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Preacher, what does that mean for you and I? We're also in the parade. Because the parade would include those that had been defeated, but it would also include those that had been set free. Following our conquering general. So are we complete in Jesus? Amen, amen, and amen. Doctrine ain't dry. Hallelujah. Doctrine fires us up when we know the truth that in Jesus we have complete salvation. We don't need anything else but Jesus. In Jesus we have complete and full forgiveness. And in Jesus we have spiritual victory. Where are you today? I just wonder, do you know Jesus? Have you been saved? Well, preacher, I've been baptized. Maybe I was, Maybe you were baptized as an infant or as a, as a child, and you, you truly never trusted Christ. Maybe you've gone through the rituals of religion, but the relationship is not there. I love one of our church members shared something yesterday. Man, it fired me up. As she was witnessing to another person, and they said, well, I really don't share religion a whole lot in this setting. And, and she said, you know, I don't either. I share about a relationship with Jesus Christ. I love it. Bam. Amen. Paul said, it's not a religion. It's a relationship. Do you know him? If you do, you've, been, you've received full forgiveness and complete salvation. But are you walking in victory today as a child of God? Is Satan just tearing you up and you're, you feel like you're fighting Heck by the acre, can I just tell you? Again, what would Colossians teach us? Put our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. In Him, we have full salvation. In Him, we have full forgiveness. And in Him, we have spiritual victory. We cannot defeat Satan on our own. We are powerless within ourselves. But in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have the victory in Him who openly spoiled and stripped the powers of principalities. And I look, it made a show. Come on. Made a victory lap. Amen. It's not prideful. He just made a victory lap and let them know openly, you are defeated and you have no authority and power because Christ conquered death, hell, and the grave. I don't know. Doctrine's pretty fired up this morning. Amen? Don't dismiss doctrine. It is the dryness at times that ignites the fuel and the explosion of God in our heart. Let's pray together. Father, I don't know anybody's heart this morning, but if there's anybody that's watching or will watch later on that's never been saved, I ask you right now to let them realize Maybe they're clinging to a baptism. Maybe they're clinging to a religious ritual they have done. But Father, if they've never truly asked you to forgive their sins and come and live in their heart, may they do that right now. But maybe there's others, God, they are saved, but they're, they're bogged down in the religious part of it. They're, they're being pulled away from the things of the world. And, and God, maybe even they feel defeated this morning because of what's happened in the world or in their world and they're stressed and, and they're frustrated and, and they're letting the enemy whisper in their ear that they're defeated. Father, thank you for the truth of your word that you openly defeated, showing triumphantly 
over Satan and the principalities and powers, stripping them of authority and power, and that you and I have victory, or the, us as the believers have victory in you, and we are grateful, Father. May the people watching today that know you're a Savior and Lord walk in this victory, I pray. And thank you for the doctrine of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for, for joining in our morning devotions. Um, happy Friday to you. I look forward to uh, being with you again Monday morning at 7 o'clock. Hey, if you don't have a church home, uh, three ways you can be with us this weekend. 9 o'clock, we'll be having a drive-in service on the property. Can I encourage you, if you're in our area and you don't have a church home, would you join us on the property? You may not feel comfortable coming into the building. The drive-in service is a tremendous opportunity. You can stay comfortable in your car. Uh, the, the message comes to the radio. I preach from the porch. Would love for you to come and be a part at 9 o'clock, Center Baptist Church, 109 Elrod Road, on the property. And then at 1030, if you feel comfortable, come be with us in the building at 1030 for our worship service there in the building. And maybe you're just not able where you can be there. Maybe you're going to be on vacation. Maybe you're not ready to come either on the property or in the building. Hey, we'll still be online at 9 o'clock for our online service. So three ways you can join us and would love for you to do that. Um, if you have a church home, hey, go support them. Support the pastor. Pray for him and pray for the people there and go be a part however you can where you are. Again, if you've got a prayer need, I would love to pray with you. Um, you could message me. You can do it um, on the comments or go to our website, centerbaptist.com, and go to uh, the Connect Center, and it'll take you right to a Connect page, and you can do that right there. Uh, but again, God bless you. Thanks for being, I mean from the depths of my heart, thank you for being a part. And I pray God would encourage you, and God would strengthen you, and God would minister to you today. Hope you have a wonderful day in the Lord. Hey, if, if you able, share this message. Share it on your page. Share it with your friends. Um, others need to know spiritual victory in Jesus. Share this with them today, all right? Again, thanks for being a part. And those that watch later on, God bless you as well. Uh, have a wonderful day in the Lord. God bless you.